Now, life among clerks at the Supreme Court has been revealed a little bit by the book by Jeffrey Tubin, The Nine. Uh, things are probably different today than they were in your day, but what were, what were some of the characteristics of that very obscure world in Washington politics? Well, at, at that time, most of the justices did not come from the world of academia or the world of being a judge. Most of them had come from politics. Most of them had been senators or uh, governors, and uh, um, Chief Justice Vinson had been not only a congressman, but he'd been chairman of the Ways and Means Committee. He'd been secretary of the Treasury. He'd been head of the War Mobilization effort. He was a very experienced uh, uh, person. Uh, we had the steel seizure case while we were there. And the Chief Justice, I always suspected, had told the President ahead of time, they were very close, that it would be legal for him to seize the steel industry. And he told them that because during the war they had seized hundreds of businesses. Mm -hmm. And um, he thought, what was the difference? This was during the Korean War. Well, it turned out he didn't have a majority. And uh, he was in the dissent. And it upset him terribly. And uh, there ended up to be a six to three vote. We had a very unusual group of law clerks while we were there. Bill Rehnquist, who later became Chief Justice, was a law clerk. Warren Christopher, who later became Secretary of State, was a law clerk. Abner Mikva, who then became uh, Chief Judge of the Court of Appeals and Counsel to the President. So we had a very bright group. And uh, the Brown case, the desegregation case, was pending in the Supreme Court at that time. So it was a very exciting time. I wanted, uh, I, I told the Chief Justice that I was going to go to work for Governor Stevenson. And uh, it was the summer, the court was closed. And I went in to see him, and I said, I'm supposed to leave in a week. Do you mind terribly if I leave now? Because I want to go to the Democratic Convention, which starts next week. He said, that's fine with me. You can go. He said, there's nothing going on here. He said, but he said, your guy's not going to get it. I said, what? He said, I was with the president last night, President Truman. <clears throat> He's lost patience with your guy, Adlai Stevenson. He says he can't make up his mind. One day it's yes, one day it's no. He said, it's going to be Alvin Barkley, who was the vice president. So I got out to the convention, and I told my colleagues, Kyle McGowan and Bill Blair, what the Chief Justice had said. They said, that's impossible. It turned out to be absolutely the God's honest truth, because they tried to get it for Barclay. The delegate said he's too old. So there was a vacuum. And that's how Stevenson ended up being nominated. Now, um, John Bartlow Martin wrote the definitive three-volume biography of uh, Adlai Stevenson. Do you think that's a good representation of his life? Well, and yes, his and, and I should tell you my role in that. Um, when I was the co-executor of Adlai's estate with his son, and we made a contract with John to write the book, and we had a provision in it that if there was any dispute, difference between John, the author, and the Stevenson family, it would be submitted prior to publication to Judge to Carl McGowan, who had been Stevenson's counsel, for decision. And by then was a judge. Then Carl became a judge. So Carl says, I'm now a federal judge. I can't do this. So I became the arbitrator. And there were a lot of arguments and a lot of tension between the family and the author, which I had to resolve. The book, I always felt that because John had been a speechwriter for Adley, he had leaned over backwards to be critical. And I used to tell that to John. 
And finally, he agreed with me in part. And he took out a few things that were unnecessarily, I thought. Uh, but the book is accurate, very accurate, and very insightful. There were those who, who thought Stevenson was a bit patrician in his way of operating. Uh, is that a fair comment about him? Well, that was his background. He came from a family. Um, his grandfather had been vice president of the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, his family owned a big newspaper in downstate Illinois. Uh, but he was, I, patrician is not a word I would use. Uh, Adley, uh, there was a certain personality trait with him. Whenever you were with him and you left, you felt better about yourself. He had a magnificent sense of humor. He was a lot of fun and uh, totally honest in his views. He was, people say he was very indecisive. He was indecisive <coughs> about his own career, what, but never on an issue, never on an issue. And many people think that he, he was just about the best orator of, of his time. What, what do you think? He was a great speaker, and some of the speeches uh, that the best ones are ones he wrote himself. He had a lot of help in later years, but the best speeches are, are, are ones he wrote himself. He was gifted, and uh, he had an eloquence which is very rare. And, and what was he like during the days when he actually was governor and he wasn't running for president? What, what was he like? He wanted not to be governor. He wanted to be senator. His real interest was international relationships. That's what he wanted. Mm -hmm. And Paul Douglas wanted to be governor. But Jack Arby, who was then the head of the Democratic Party, wanted Douglas to run against the incumbent senator because Douglas was a war veteran mm -hmm. and he thought that was important. And it then, so Stevenson ended up running for governor, an office he didn't want. Douglas ended up running for senator, an office he didn't want. But they were both elected in a landslide. And once Stevenson what became governor, he loved it. And this was 1948. 1948. Right. Um, now, in terms of his his run for the presidency, it, it seems as if your your main role was was helping him uh, manage Illinois. But did you also get involved in campaign activities? I did in 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 uh, two ways. I helped a little bit on a couple of speeches, and I was sent to Wisconsin because that was my home uh -huh. to be the advance man. And I arranged for a private meeting with Adley with the editorial board of the Milwaukee Journal. And the Milwaukee Journal was one of the two papers in the United States that endorsed Stevenson. So I was very proud of that. Um, 56, I had a bigger role in the campaign. And um, although I, well, I had one experience I should tell you about. <coughs> Normally, when Adley went somewhere, Bill Blair was his staff that accompanied him. Summer of 55, I was playing golf with my partner, Howard Trans. My wife called me. She said, Governor Stevenson is trying to reach you. And I got him and he said, you must come out to the house. You got to help me. And tomorrow I'm going to give a speech in Texas. You got to go with me. Bill Blair is sick. So I want you to do this. So I went out to the house, and it turned out President Eisenhower had, had a heart attack. And the press was all over Stevenson because it looked like the president might die. So we were dealing with the press all day Sunday. And then Monday morning, we left for Texas, Adley was giving a speech at the University of Texas in Austin. Then we were going to get in a car with Speaker Rayburn, Sam Rayburn, the Speaker of the House, and drive to the ranch of Lyndon Johnson, 
who was also recovering from a heart attack in Texas. Lyndon at that time was majority leader of the Senate. So we got there very late at night and Lyndon was waiting up for us, much to the dismay of his wife because the doctor had said he should be getting a lot of rest. He greeted us and he said, look, the press is all over the place here because Ike had the heart attack. And they see the three leading Democrats in the United States, Speaker of the House, the Majority Leader, the titular leader of the party. We cannot look like we're plotting how to take over the country. So we're going to be up and out at 6 o'clock in the morning and take the press with us on a tour. That's what we did. We spent the day there. Then we got back in the plane to fly back to Chicago, just the two of us. And Adley turned to me and he said, um, Lyndon and Sam say, if I want the Democratic nomination next year, I'll have to run in the primaries. What do you think? I said, of course they're right. I said, if President Eisenhower doesn't run again, every Democrat is going to want the nomination. If President Eisenhower does run again, you should forget about it because there's no way you could beat Eisenhower. Forget it. But if he does run, you'd he said, I'm not going to do it. He said, I'm not going to run around these shopping centers like I'm running for sheriff. Well, that's what he ended up doing. He ended up in that. He lost a primary in Minnesota to Kefauver. And he had a fight back and won the primary. He won the nomination. I knew it was a hopeless, hopeless cause. Uh, and he lost by a bigger margin in 56 than he did in 52. Now, what, what was Adderley Stevenson like as a law partner? He liked only the big picture. He was not a detail yeah. guy as a, a lawyer. He, he loved a negotiation. He was very good at that. Uh, he and I worked on one brief in the Supreme Court, and he was a very gifted writer. But he was not what you and I would call a real right. lawyer. Now, you always have been. You, you, you're a lawyer's lawyer. I, I, I'm able to say that. Where did that come from? Who, who were your mentors? Well, my partner, you know, Howard Trenins and I have been together since law school. He was my professor in law school. And when then we were law clerks together, we were law partners together. Howard is what I would call a great lawyer. I'm not a great lawyer. But he, I, I'm good at certain things, but he's a great lawyer. And um, I think uh, today I'm not so sure I would want to start being a lawyer because things have gotten so specialized, so terribly specialized. I like being a general practitioner and counseling people, and that's dying. Uh, 